Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. Investing in emerging markets is like Marmite. It divides opinion. Pessimists point to the fact that emerging markets have stagnated over the past decade, while US markets have powered ahead. Optimists point to projections that in 10 years' time, emerging economies will account for two-thirds of global GDP. I'm joined in our Edinburgh studio by one of these optimists, Charles Plowden. Charles is manager of both the Monks Investment Trust and the Global Alpha Growth Fund. But before we start, some important information. Please remember that, as with all investments, your capital is at risk. We'll be talking about emerging markets, which can be more volatile than developed markets. Charles, why the optimism? Why the optimism? It's really the scale of the opportunity and the momentum. There are some unstoppable forces in the world at the moment, and one of them is the improving health, wealth, welfare, the energy in emerging markets. This is where the young populations of the world are. This is where education is improving and is is often well ahead of already what we can do in the West. It's where a lot of the new technologies are being adopted at a much bigger scale and much greater speed than they are in the West. We see it as being where the best and largest opportunities are. Now, part of that, actually, I have to would say comes from a little bit of pessimism about (laughs) what's lacking in the developed world. We are already developed. There's none of this catch up. We're stuck in our, our ways. There's a lot of legacy issues. There's a lot of old decaying infrastructure. And you contrast that with some of the the parts of the world where a lot of new investment is going in for the first time. And it's really very striking. So as a global portfolio manager, how do you decide how much of that portfolio to commit to emerging markets, Charles? Everything we do is is stock specific. So it's bottom up, one company at a time. But where we look for those companies will often dictate how, how many we'll find and how successful we'll be. So how many? I mean, our emerging market exposure has, has varied from, you know, high single figures, 7 or 8% of the portfolio, up to mid-20s. And we're currently towards the top of that. Now, of course, there is one thing, just how do you measure your emerging market exposure? The indices uh, would tell you that companies that are listed in emerging markets that's one measure. So that's about 12% of the global index is said to be emerging markets. On that measure, we're at about 20%. So we're nearly double. But of course, there are a lot of Western companies whose main market, sometimes their only market, will be in emerging markets. So companies like Pernod Ricard, the French spirits company, very big in China, very big in India, uh, we think of that as an emerging market consumption exposed company. That's why we own it. And on that measure, we're around about 24, 25. If we look at companies that might be British or French or American, but still sell predominantly into emerging markets. And there's often a perception, you know, if we if we read the papers, we see uh, reports about corruption in Russia, riots in Hong Kong, unrest in South America, that emerging markets are, are more risky to invest in. Is that the case? Well, it's definitely a strong perception. And I think a lot of that's based on fear. Most of us are less familiar with those economies. They are developing faster, and that does lead to more imbalances that can come and also be addressed in the short term. But I think it's a sort of lazy Western perception that they, the markets are more volatile, the economies are more volatile, but are they riskier? Our view at Bailey Gifford is very much that volatility is not a bad thing. It provides as many opportunities as it causes problems. What we're worried about is the long term. And is, are things getting better in the long term or are they getting worse in the long term? In emerging markets, I would say there's much more certainty that in t- of where we'll be in 10 years' time than there is maybe in Europe or America. So I would say, taking a 10-year view, they almost feel less risky Less risky than developed markets? Well, less risky, yes, possibly than developed markets. I mean, who knows what the the economics, the politics, the the fiscal 
position is going to be in developed markets, whereas I think we've got a clearer idea in emerging markets. And, you know, it used to be that the political uncertainty was all in Latin America and Africa. And, um, you know, we could always say oh, that's not investable. We don't know who's going to be in charge of Venezuela or Brazil or Argentina. But I think we've got serious issues here in Europe and in North America at the moment about you know the direction of political leadership there. The cohesion of the social fabric is under question almost everywhere. And I think actually in somewhere like China or Indonesia, there is a much clearer sort of national will and a national project to repeat what has effectively been the success of, of a country like South Korea. And I think there's lots of emerging markets that would like to replicate that success. And this is really interesting because you studied history. It's something that you think about in terms of your investment decisions. But what can we learn from history through the direction of travel of emerging markets? There's a danger here because I was a medieval historian. So when <laughs> I, I think of history, I actually think in history in sort of 400-year periods. And I think, you know, you don't have to be a, an expert on the history of the world to realize that Asia was the leading driver of world culture, sophistication, science, economic activity for centuries and centuries and centuries, principally based on China. And it's really only the last three or four hundred years or since the 16th century that the West became the leading world power. Of course, they largely did that by stealing resources, gold, slaves, whatever, from the emerging world that they discovered, you know, principally in Latin America. It wasn't because we were cleverer. It was because we had more gold that allowed us to buy in all the expertise that we might need or to build the universities or so on. It wasn't bottom-up economic development. So I think all that's happening now is that uh, particularly in Asia, it's, it is less the case in Africa or uh, Latin America at the moment. The statistics point that out, that India and China are becoming the, you know, the, the world leaders in many aspects. I mean, I suppose it is really explicitly about China. And I think a lot of what we're seeing at the moment with Trump and the trade wars and so on and tariffs is the sort of final throes of America, you know, reluctant to give up its leadership. But it's an inevitability. So I suppose the historical perspective is that the West had it its own way for 500 years, but that's now changing. And presumably that's why Billy Gifford is opening an office in Shanghai. Well, it's one of the reasons that we're opening an office in Shanghai. We think we need to get closer to the companies because, and this is actually ties in, a lot of Chinese companies are not going to make the trek to Edinburgh or even to London to visit us. Edinburgh and London and the UK are going to be increasingly irrelevant if you're running a multi-billion dollar company from China. It's not where the money is. It's not where, you know, it's not, it's, it's where you go on holiday, not where you go on business. So we think we need an office staffed by locals who understand the culture, who can speak the language, who can go out and put Chinese companies through our research framework, our research lens, and then pass their views back to Edinburgh. And it'll inform our decision making. But I think it's going to be very hard to remain close to Chinese companies from however many thousands of miles away, Edinburgh is 6,000 miles, I think you're going to have to be there. So we are started with a small research office. I think there's going to be four investors initially, um, but it will grow. And looking at your portfolio, Charles, I see Prudential, AIA Group, Ping An Insurance. There are a lot of companies there that are focusing on insurance in Asia. Why that focus? It's quite simple, really. As people across Asia start to become more wealthy, they move from subsistence and have they got food, have they got a roof, to education, to health to consumption they eat you know better food they drink branded beer or you know they 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 become aspirational rather than subsidy and then you get to a stage at approximately the levels of wealth that exist in china and across much of asia today that they start thinking about the future it's not about what are we going to eat today it's about what are we going to do in 5 years time when our children are you know want to go to school 
and that's when they start saving. So there are two big attractive macro themes, I think, across emerging markets at the moment. One is consumption. But the interesting one, or the more interesting one, I think, to us is the long-term savings play because it's very regulated. It's quite difficult to do. It's quite a sophisticated part of the financial services sector. And there are relatively few players. So you've got a similar sort of growth dynamic uh, as you have on the consumer side. But on the saving side, there are far fewer players because regulators keep the weak ones away. So what you tend to have is a small number of very strong financial companies, tightly regulated, who get a disproportionate share of you know what is an enormous enormous market and not just enormous but a 30-year growth market and it's it's quite obvious why the asian population need long-term savings it's also quite clear why their governments are very supportive because they don't want to take on the whole burden they've seen what pensions are doing in america and across europe and they'd much rather if there's a private sector solution. They'd much rather encourage and subsidise and educate and regulate to make sure that 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 happens. So you've got government support, you've got popular, you've got demand for the product, and there are a limited number of players. And I think looking at competition between them sort of misses the point that this is a market that can grow at 20% a year for the next 20 years and be many, many multiples of its current size. So yes, it's also actually, it's quite a microcosm of the way we think about emerging markets. So Charles, we've talked a lot about China so far, but what about India? Because one of the exciting companies that you are invested in is Reliance. Well, I think a good word to attach to Reliance is exciting. It's a buccaneering business led by, I think he's now India's richest man, Mukesh Ambani. And Yes, excitement. What we really want is growth. And I think Reliance is very well placed to deliver it. So the story of Reliance is quite interesting. It started as an agricultural business. It then moved into fabrics. From fabrics, it moved into oil refining to make nylon and and the artificial materials. It now has one of the world's largest, most efficient and most modern oil refineries recently completed. And it is intending to use the cash flow, which is about $10 billion a year from its oil refineries, to develop a range of other businesses. Now, the one that is already very, very well known is called Geo, and it's India's leading mobile telephone operator with somewhere around 300, 350 million subscribers. But it's a business that's four years old. And basically, by throwing money at heavily subsidizing mobile data costs and call charges. They've become the leading mobile operator in India very quickly. But the plan now is not just to limit uh, their, their activities to mobile telephones, but to connect their mobile telephones to their also India's leading formal retailer. Now, 90% of all retail trade in India is informal. It's street stalls and markets and so on. But of the 10% that isn't, Reliance is, has the leading share, about a 25% share of formal retail, which is what we would think of shops and supermarkets. So, But they're trying to come from a mobile phone, a, a smartphone angle, into e-commerce and retail. And they're not only interested in formalizing the market. They're also tying up with, I think it's 10 million mom and pop shops all over India. They're installing EPOS, electronic point of sale equipment, which means that people will pay using the Geo payments app, but they'll be on the system. And these small retailers will also become the delivery, the logistics hub for online e-commerce so for the the likes of Amazon. So they're not going to reinvent UPS in India. They're just going to use the small local shop as the delivery hub. And there's 10 million or so of them. So the ambition of Reliance in over a 10-year period will be to convert itself from uh, an oil refining business to the largest and most modern e-commerce and communications and media network in the world. And because this is India, it's a very protected market. There's not, I mean, Amazon are trying very hard, but they're finding at every step that foreigners have slightly more regulations to cope with. Reliance as the local champion is bringing jobs, is bringing wealth, is bringing choice 
to millions and millions of Indians who haven't really had access to this sort of service before. It has uh, government patronage. Uh, it has local power and knowledge. And, you know, it seems highly likely to us to be a success. Charles, I think that's a good place to end. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast, and I hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you, Margaret. You can find our podcast, Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking at baileygifford.com forward slash podcasts. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and TuneIn. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please spread the word. And there's more about Charles's thoughts on Asian insurers in the autumn 2019 issue of Trust, which is Bailey Gifford's Investment Trust magazine. You can subscribe to this and read his article at baileygifford.com forward slash trust. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which was released on permanent vacation. Until next time. (laughs) 